Hello. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our today's speaker for Institute Colloquium. Our today's speaker is Professor Bharat Ratra, who is a uh, distinguished professor of physics at Kansas State University. So, Professor Ratra did his uh, master's from IIT Delhi in 1982, and then he joined uh, Leonard Susskind and Michael Peskin at Stanford University for his uh, PhD. In 1986, he completed his PhD, and after that, he did several postdoctoral uh, research, postdoctoral studies in Princeton, California, Caltech, and MIT. And then in 1996, uh, he joined Kansas State University, and since then, he's still there. And uh, he's mainly known for his uh, very famous work on dynamical dark energy and on the quantum mechanical generation of energy density and magnetic field fluctuation during inflation. So today, Professor uh, uh, Ratra, he uh, will talk on this uh, accelerated expanding universe. We have requested him uh, to give a very pedagogical kind of talk so that it is accessible to all. So Professor Ratra, please. Thank you for the very, very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. So this is going to be um, quite an introductory level talk, and I hope I don't bore all the experts. So uh, I, I want to point out this web page, and uh, that's associated with the card I gave you. So if you're interested, there's some very good videos on there explaining global warming in non-technical terms. So I, I'm, I'm a cosmologist, and it's a really exciting time to be doing cosmology. Um, because we have many great new telescopes, both in space and on the ground. And you've probably heard of many of these, and uh, you've definitely heard of the James Webb. And they're getting a lot of new data that's uh, reinforcing two very striking results that have been around for a few decades now. So the first one is when you look at the energy budget of the universe now, we know that 5% um, of it is made up of atoms and molecules and charged particles that we're familiar with, and we don't know what the other 95% is. We see the gravitational effects of the other 95%, and it's divided into two categories, one's called dark matter and one's called dark energy. But it's quite striking that we don't know what makes up 95% of the energy budget of the universe. The other thing that's really interesting and probably going to be more profound in the long run if it really gets reinforced is that um, these observations are indicating that either quantum mechanics or relativity or perhaps both are incomplete descriptions of reality and need to be improved upon. And if that gets reinforced with new observations, that's going to be very profound because quantum mechanics and relativity have been the foundations of physics for more than a century now. So, um, oops, maybe I'll try this way. Okay, so um, this is quite close to where I live. Um, it's um, grass plants and um, liquid bison, American bison back on it. And it's a really nice place to go hiking. So I have some questions. Uh, how many of you have gone hiking 10 kilometers in your life? You can put up your hands. What about 100 kilometers total integrated in your life? Integrated. Integrated, yeah, one, two, three, what about a thousand kilometers? <laughs> Maybe borderline. So, so there, there's some upper limit to which you can access um, given your senses. And um, the next thing I want you to do is grab a, a single, single strand of your hair for those of you who have hair and kind of feel it. <laughs> so, so is, is that, that's probably the finest thing you can feel. And if you have very fine hair, the diameter is maybe 10 microns. If you have thick hair, maybe it's 100 microns. And um, those are kind of the limits to which you can access. Oops, that one right at the end. That's not what I wanted to do. Okay. Okay, so here um, is some length scales in meters. So you can, I mean, if we have enough time, you can go walk 10 to the 5 meters or 10 to the 6 meters in your lifetime. 
And maybe your fingers are sensitive enough to go down to feel things of order 10 to the minus 4 meters. But um, that, that's the region of the length scales that you can access directly through your senses. And um, if you're very, very clever like Newton, you can bounce balls and you can watch falling apples and then you can figure out conservation of energy and conservation of momentum and the inverse square law. But you cannot do physics the same way on much, much smaller scales or much, much larger scales because you cannot directly access those scales with your senses. And you've got to use measuring devices, so telescopes, microscopes, particle accelerators, and you end up mostly collecting photons, and uh, at least on the large scales. And maybe in the future, you'll collect neutrinos and gravitons too, but mostly you collect photons, and you turn those into electronic signals that you store in your computer. And then you build mathematical models of the phenomenon you're trying to study and try to make predictions. And you compare those predictions to the photons that you convert into electronic signals and store it in your computer. And there's no guarantee that your Newtonian laws are going to also apply over here or down here. And in fact, they don't. I mean, quantum mechanics, um, also over here and relative fields over here. And um, they, they, in some sense, are counterintuitive because all your intuition is built up over here through your senses. And the way you build up intuition here and here is to kind of make use of uh, these mathematical models and make predictions. And it becomes more complicated on large scales and small scales. And today, I'm going to concentrate on, on the large scales but if you're interested in looking at this a little bit more, there's a couple of very, very famous videos. One's called The Powers of Ten by the Ames Brothers. And you can search Google and see that. And you can also see an update of that from the American Museum of Natural History. They're, they're quite short and they're very instructive. But I want to spend a little bit of time walking outwards here. And um, this again. OK, we'll start over here. And you, you probably see this guy before. So instead of using the meter, I'm going to use the Einstein as my unit of length. And so uh, Einstein is roughly two meters. And you can also do this in terms of masses or time scales, but we won't have time, so we'll just concentrate on light scales. So we can go from here to this small planet. And this picture has only become possible in the last six or so decades since we've had satellites in space with cameras. And one way to think about this is to build a, a tunnel from the North Pole to the South Pole and leave a base here. And then if you get six and a half million Einsteins and put one down here and the next on his shoulder and the next on his shoulder and so on, you'll eventually reach the North Pole. So that's roughly a factor of 10 million going from a human scale to the scale of a small planet. We can step out further and look at our nearest neighbor star, the sun. And you can do the same thing here. Um, if you want, it's probably easier to think about it in terms of stacking up Earths. So you'd have to stack 100 Earths to get to the diameter of the sun. And so it's 100 times roughly um, 10 million Einsteins. So it's a billion Einsteins roughly, or 700 million Einsteins. And so that's another. So the first one is a factor of 10 to the 7. This is another factor of 10 to the 2. And we can go and look at other objects on bigger scales. So maybe the first thing to look at is the Earth-Sun distance. And the Earth goes around the Sun in an approximately circular orbit. It's elliptical. But if you average it out and look at that average radius, that's about 1.5 into 10 to 11 meters. And it gets quite complicated using the meter as the length scale there because you have to carry around many parts of 10. So people who study planetary systems introduce a new length scale, and that's the astronomical unit, and that's abbreviated the AU. And it's just the, a radius of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Another way to measure lengths on these scales is to make use of light travel time. It's in vacuum, light has perfected cruise control, and it always travels at approximately 3 times 10 to 8 meters per second. So for it to cover this distance, it would take 500 seconds. And so you can use that time and say that one AU is equal to 500 seconds. Or when you look at the sun, um, 
that light left the surface of the sun 500 seconds ago in the past and it traveled in a straight line and it hit your retina and it got converted into an electronic signal in your brain and that made the sun's image. But you shouldn't directly look at the sun without protective equipment. But it's kind of really important to realize you're not looking at um, the sun at the same time. You're looking at it in the past and the same thing's true in this room. This light travels a foot in a billionth of a second. When you're looking at the person next to you, you're seeing that person two nanoseconds ago in the past. You're not seeing that person in the present. And your brain doesn't register those tiny times. So you kind of intuitively assume you're seeing the person in the present, but that's not true. So we can step out even further and look at the next nearest star, um, which is Proxima Centauri. And that's about a factor of 10 to the 5. So the Earth-Sun distance is a factor of 100 compared to the Sun's radius. So if you wanted to cover this, and this is not the scale, you'd have to put 100 suns in a row, and then you'd get out of the Earth's orbit. And then you can take another factor of 10 to the 5 and go from the Sun to Proxima Centauri. And there, the light travel time is four years, or in terms of AUs, it's roughly 200,000 AUs. So it's getting to be many parts of 10 again, even for the AU. And so people who study collections of stars don't use the AU as the unit for length. They use a different unit, which is the parsec, which is an abbreviation for a parallax of an arc second. And that itself is also abbreviated PC. So um, this is a cartoon explanation of a parsec. So you take your observer and give her a telescope and ask her to go very, very far away. And the distance that she goes is determined by uh, this part over here, the one AU of the Earth's orbit around the sun, and uh, this angle. So when this angle is one arc second, and then and she is subtending that one AU with an angle of one arc second, she is said to be one parsec away. And in terms of uh, probably more conventional physics units, the conversion is just about three and a quarter years for a parsec. So if you travel at the speed of light, it would take you three and a quarter years to cover this distance if she was far away enough so that one arc second subtended one AU. So um, to make this a little bit more concrete, we can look at numbers we're more familiar with, like the Earth-Moon distance which is about uh, four times 10 to the eight meters on average. And the light travel time for that is about one and one third seconds. And that's the furthest humans have been. Um, maybe a characteristic size of the solar system is uh, Pluto's orbit around the sun. And that's about 40 AUs radius. So in terms of light travel time, that's six hours. And so when you're looking at Pluto through a telescope, that light left six hours ago and traveled in a straight line to you. And it, it took quite a bit of time to get to you. So the furthest we've sent anything are the two Voyager missions, which NASA launched in 1977. And um, these numbers are from the 40th anniversary, so it's from 2017. And at that point, Voyager 1 had gone 140 AUs, so three and a half times the distance to Pluto, or in terms of light travel time, roughly um, 19 and uh, 19 and a third hours. And if we can move that to parsecs, it's less than a thousandth of a parsec. So I mean, this is a very, very small distance on the scale of distances between stars. So this is. Um, some scales we can step out further and this picture is probably better seen on your computer you can search for it it's the european southern observatory milky way picture and you can blow it up on your computer and zoom in and look at it in great detail and you can just compare this to earlier pictures of our milky way this is from palomar and probably this is the easiest one to discuss so this is um the collection of stars we live in, it's about maybe 200 billion stars. The typical star is a little bit less massive than the sun, maybe about half as massive as the sun. So this is a huge, huge object, and maybe we should start with uh, its geometry. So if you have a Frisbee or one of those discs you throw, it's pretty much like that, except there's a bulge in the center over here where it's flared up a bit. 
And if you look at it from the top, um, you'll see the spiral arms, and you can see them from the bottom, and you can see this in external galaxies pretty easily. Um, so maybe we should start with the, the diameter of the disk. It's 50 kiloparsecs, so kilo is a thousand, so 50,000 parsecs, and a parsec is about three and a quarter years of life travel time. So uh, multiply that by three and a quarter, and you get about 160,000 years. So if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you 160,000 years to cross this. And you can compare that to the distance to the sun, which is 500 seconds, or the distance to Proxima Centauri, which is four years. So this is a huge object. And the fact that it's spread out like this immediately tells you there's something else going on there besides gravity. Because if it was only subject to gravitational force, everything would be pulled together. And what's happening is that in the disk, the stars are rotating around the center, so they have kinetic energy or energy of motion, and that's resisting um, gravity collapsing them all down to a point. There's a bulge in the center, and it's, that's not held up by systematic rotation. That's held up by random motions of the stars, but they still have kinetic energy, and so they also don't collapse down to a point. And at the nucleus is where a black hole lives. It's a pretty puny black hole. It's got a mass of maybe 4 million times the mass of the sun. A lot of other galaxies have black holes that are billions, a billion times the mass of the sun. And that's the center of the galaxy. The sun is about one third of the way out from the center. It's about eight kiloparsecs from the center. And so this thing is rotating, and it's embedded in something called the halo, which is probably a factor of 10 bigger in linear scale. And that's where a lot of the dark matter is. Um, and in this halo, we have these collections of stars, collections of hundreds of thousands to maybe 500,000 stars each. They're called globular clusters. These are the oldest stars, and they're orbiting the center of the galaxy. So that's the, the thing we live in. And if you know, um, I mean, if you can go out of Calcutta, you should be able to see this um, galaxy pretty clearly, at least in the fall. Um, it stands out if you go to a dark sky area. So that's our galaxy. And there are other galaxies, there's many of them. And this is our nearest neighboring big galaxy. It's the Andromeda galaxy. And if you know where to look, you can see this with your eyes too. You don't need a telescope for it. It's also a spiral galaxy. It's got a bulge in the center. And you can see the spiral arms over here. And it's a little bit bigger. Um, so maybe uh, it takes about 200,000 years to cross the speed of light. And it's about um, two and a half million years away from us. So when you look at Andromeda, the photons that are hitting your eye now, that's Andromeda two and a half million years ago. And that's kind of an interesting time for human evolution. So probably the most famous hominin fossil is Lucy from Ethiopia. And she apparently climbed up into a tree to escape predators and fell asleep and fell out of the tree um, approximately three and a quarter million years ago, a little bit before the photons you now see from Andromeda, left Andromeda, but that's kind of the time scale. So galaxies um, are like people, and some of them like collecting together. So they're basically big chunks of mass, and because of gravity, they come and attract each other, and they start orbiting each other. And some of them form these collections called clusters of galaxies. And this is the central region of uh, a nearby cluster of galaxies. It's called the Volga Cluster. And it's about 20 million parsecs away from us. And this is just the central region. Every speck of light you see here is a galaxy. And each of them has maybe um, 200 billion stars, or 300 billion stars, or 100 billion stars. And you can kind of see some spiral galaxies and some elliptical galaxies. And the scale here uh, is a few megaparsecs. So maybe uh, light travel time is five to 10 million years to cross this at the speed of light. So this is one cluster. There's um, lots and lots of clusters. And so if you look out here, 
Um, this is a, a picture I can show you how it's taken relative to the Milky Way. So we're over here on the sun, and they're looking up here and looking at, at uh, a region over here. So it's kind of part of a sphere, and they've taken a wedge out of it and figured out where all the, the galaxies are in that region. And um, this is uh, was taken by Shane and Bertanen at the Lick Observatory, which is in the mountains outside of San Jose in the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And the map was made um, later in the early 1970s by Selma, Sebus, um, Growth, and Peebles. And this guy it is um, the coma cluster. It's directly overhead um, the North Galactic Pole. So if you set up a coordinate system where the North Galactic Pole is here and the South Galactic Pole is here, and you set up spherical polar coordinates, the coma cluster is pretty much directly up there. And um, that's a collection of four or 5,000 galaxies, each of them with maybe 200 billion stars, and it's just a few pixels over here. You can see other clusters, lots of them, and if you look carefully, you can see two other geometrical structures here. You see these dark regions, and these guys are called the voids, and you can also see one-dimensional structures like that, and like that, and that, and those are called the filaments. And so the way to think about this is to think about bubbles in a basin. So the bright galaxies tend to avoid the center of the bubbles and they tend to be on the surface of the bubbles. And where two bubbles intersect, you have typically a, a one dimensional intersection and there's an enhancement in the number of bright galaxies there. And where a lot of these uh, filaments come together, they drain into the clusters of galaxies. So you can kind of see them draining into here and here and here and here. And so there's quite a lot of structure here. And a distribution like this is said to be anisotropic. So if you say something's isotropic, you're standing at one point and looking around you and it looks the same. But on these scales, so the scale here is about 300 megaparsecs. So it's roughly a billion years to cross it at the speed of light. So on this scale, the distribution is pretty anisotropic, and that's kind of not something that's very odd or anything. But the interesting thing that happens is that when you get to a factor of 20 or 30 bigger and look at the distribution, it becomes very isotropic. So this is the largest scale picture we can see of the universe at the present time. It's uh, taken by the Planck satellite, which is the European Space Agency satellite. And this satellite had microwave detectors on it. So they're basically looking at um, microwave radiation. And this is the optical of the Big Bang. So the way to think about this is put yourself in the center of a big beach ball, and you're measuring the temperature of the photons that's coming from that surface to you. And that's what this experiment did. Um, so these are long wavelength microwaves, much, much longer than visible light. And um, maybe the first thing you want, so, so what I've done is I've taken that interior of the beach pole and I've sliced it from the North Pole to the South Pole. So the North Pole's here, the South Pole's here. And if you want to reassemble it, you take this edge and join it up and close it around you. And it's the same as this edge over here. And um, this is the temperature across the sky of the color. And um, maybe the first thing you're interested in is the average temperature. So if you average this across the whole sky, it's roughly about two and three quarter Kelvin. So it's very, very cold. Um, so this room is probably roughly at 300 Kelvin. Once you have the average, maybe you're interested in the difference between the hot spots and the cold spots. And that difference is roughly about 30 or 40 microkelvin compared to an average of three kelvin. So if we just say delta T is 30 microkelvin and T is three kelvin, then delta T over T is one part in 10 to the five, or the bumpiness is one part, it's 0.001%. So the difference in the delta T over T from here to here is uh, very, very small. 
So it looks the same across the whole sky, and you need this very, very sensitive instrument to notice these differences of one part per ten to the five. So this is quite isotropic compared to stuff on scales a factor of ten smaller, which is pretty anisotropic. So these are two really important facts about the universe locally on small scales in our neighborhood matter and radiation is spatially anisotropic i mean we know that in this room if you look to your right you look above you you don't see the same person and we know that from the surface of the earth you have oceans you have mountains and you know that for um the solar system you know that the milky way there's all um breaking of isotropy there, but when you get out to really large scales, um, on the scales of 500 million years or so, then it starts becoming isotropic in a statistical sense. And the bumpiness on the scales of billions of light years is one part of 10 to the five. So it's isotropic on large scales and it's anisotropic on small scales. And I'm not gonna talk much more about these, but if you're interested in how cosmologists try to explain these two facts is that they use this model called the inflation model of the very early universe and it qualitatively explains both these facts and it can probably do pretty well even quantitatively but the measurements are not yet precise enough to um, really test inflation so we don't know if it's really correct or not but you can learn about inflation you can just google it uh, to say inflation in the very early universe and go to wikipedia or go to scientific american or discover or physics today or anything reputable and you can follow up there so there's another really important fact about the universe is that it expands and so when we say that something's expanding that immediately means you have measuring devices that are not also expanding exactly the same way and I, I have a, a small measuring device here, and we can use this as an example. And so it's kind of useful to understand um, how this guy, why this guy is not expanding and the universe might be expanding. So on, on the scale of our measuring devices in the universe, there are two forces that are relevant. So the first is gravity. So this has a mass, the Earth has a mass, and if I don't support it, um, the Inverse square law is going to pull both the Earth and this measuring device together. And gravity is attractive. So the other force that's relevant is the electromagnetic force or the electric force. And there's a difference there compared to gravity that both inverse square law forces, so in sort of Newton's law, you have Coulomb's law. But in the electromagnetic case, you have like charges and unlike charges. And like charges repel and unlike charges attract. So electromagnetic force has the, both an attractive part and a repulsive part, while gravity is always attractive. So the first thing we might be interested in is to take maybe two protons and compare the electromagnetic repulsion to the gravitational attraction. And they're both inverse square laws, so the distances cancel out if you take the ratios of the two forces. I'm sure most of you have computed this, and um, for those of you who haven't, the electromagnetic repulsion between two protons is roughly a power of 10 to the 36 bigger than the gravitational attraction. So electromagnetism is an extremely strong force on the scale of gravity. But the thing that's really important to realize is that in this object and in us and in the Earth, we're all made up of atoms and I guess maybe molecules, but we can just think about atoms. So atoms have a, a, a nucleus that has a positive charge and it has an equal and opposite negative charge in the electron cloud. And so we're made up of things that are basically neutral. And so electromagnetism is kind of irrelevant on scales uh, much, much larger than the scales on which you have atoms because you have, um, so if you just think about you and your neighbor, you're pulling your neighbor towards you gravitationally, but you're neither pushing or pulling your neighbor electromagnetically because your electrons are pushing her protons, pulling her protons to you and they're pushing her electrons away and you're made up of the same number of electrons and protons. So you're not being affected that much by electromagnetism 
I mean, unless you comb your hair really vigorously or something and built up some static charge and then there's the uh, effect left over. But once you get to larger and larger scales and heavier and heavier objects, if you compare it to planets, there's almost no electromagnetic force between them, but there's a pretty strong gravitational force compared to the force between you and your neighbor. And if you go to two galaxies, the gravitational force is much, 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 much more important than the electromagnetic force, even though electromagnetism is 36 bars of 10 stronger than gravity. And so when we get out to very large scales, we have to use the best model we have for gravity because that's the only relevant force for cosmology. And that's Einstein's general theory of relativity. So Einstein kind of Newton um, had a fixed space and uniform time, and everything was happening in that fixed space and time was running uniformly. And then Einstein realized that if you're dealing with phenomenon close to the speed of light or in strong gravitational fields or in very large length scales, you can have a more accurate description of reality by allowing space and time to deform in response to what you were studying. And that's what general relativity does. It makes space and time dynamical. And so the way you kind of build up intuition here is to solve the equations of general relativity for the cosmological model you're interested in, and then um, use that to describe the phenomenon you're seeing. So what happens is that general relativity kind of wanders around in the universe, and where it finds regions that are under dense on average, it creates new space, and that space has to go somewhere, and that just spreads out. And everything lives in space, and so everything gets taken along for the ride. And that's the expansion of the universe. But your meter stick is held together by electromagnetism, and the gravitational force is almost irrelevant on the scale here because it's 36 powers of 10 weaker than the electromagnetic force. And so it doesn't affect your meter sticks. So, um, so maybe we should look at some cartoon explanations of what's happening. So I've got a, a, a one-dimensional expanding universe here. So it's one-dimensional because I can draw an origin here and then just draw a bunch of distances here and I can figure out where I am. And I put a wave on this and maybe I'll try this even though I only have two hands. I'll put my meter stick here. And so if I have an expanding universe, so you can see the wave, you can see the peaks and troughs. This is my meter stick, it's held together by electromagnetism. And you can see when the universe expands, the wavelength gets bigger and bigger because you have a fixed meter stick here. And when it contracts, the wavelength gets smaller. So if you start out with blue light and you let the universe expand, it might become red. So there's a couple of things wrong with this demonstration. Um, first of all, gravity does not go to the ends of the universe, and there's probably no ends to the universe. So gravity is not pulling. So what it's doing is it's going into the universe, it's creating new space, and that space is spreading out. And this doesn't happen just in one dimension. It happens in every dimension, every spatial dimension. So we have a three-dimensional space here. There's the vertical dimension, and there's two horizontal dimensions. And so you have the expansion in all three dimensions. And um, let's just do a little bit of math here for this guy. So here's my um, elastic band, and this is it at an earlier time, and this is it at a later time. And I need something to characterize the local size of the universe, so I'll just use the distance between the hands. And I put a wave here, and this is when the light was emitted. It's emitted with some fixed wavelength, lambda naught. And as time goes on, the wavelength gets bigger because the universe is getting bigger, and you can just draw this on an elastic band and see this is how it works. So the wavelength is going to be proportional to the distance between the hands, and I mean, just draw that and you can see that. And um, so cosmologists roughly call the distance, the local distance between the hands, uh, the scale factor, and the symbol for that is A as a function of T time. So A gets bigger going this way as the universe expands, and time gets bigger this way, so the baby universe is up here, and uh, we're over here at the present time. But astronomers prefer not to use the scale factor. Instead, they use this variable they call the redshift, 
which is defined through this equation, one plus z is the value of the scale factor at the present time at which you're doing the observations, divided by the scale factor value at the time at which the light was omitted. So if you omit the light at, at the present time, that a of p will be a of now, and a now divided by a now is going to be one. So z is going to be zero. So redshift zero is here. But if you omit the line earlier on, so you're looking at a quasar or something in the past, then at that point, A of T was smaller because the distance between the hands is closer then than it is now. So A of T would be smaller than A of now. So the right-hand side would be bigger than one and Z would be bigger than zero. So Z gets bigger as you go back in the past. So higher redshift is in the past. Well, the scale factor gets bigger as you go to the present and time gets bigger as you go to the present. So we can move on and look at this guy. So he um, looked at external galaxies in 1912, a little bit earlier using this telescope at Lowell Observatory. And he looked at them and he realized that uh, he could identify spectral lines but the spectral line wavelengths he was seeing that corresponded to specific atoms were longer than the wavelength he was seeing in the lab. So if you're looking at hydrogen, the wavelength would be longer through his telescope. He collected this light and passed it through a diffraction grating and broke it up into the spectrum. So that's just uh, the Doppler effect as things are moving away. And, and you've noticed this with a fire engine or an ambulance or a police car with its siren. As it's moving away from you, the pitch drops, and as it moves towards you, the pitch goes up. So you get red shifting as it's moving away from you. And that's what Cypher thought was happening, that everything was moving away from him. But he couldn't really understand what this phenomenon was. So one possibility was that in the past, there was this huge explosion centered on roughly where Cypher was in 1912, and everything started moving away. But that's not what's happening. It's a little bit more complicated. And maybe I should start with this. So when we have the expansion, so the ping pong balls are like galaxies after they've been formed. And when we have the expansion, what's expanding is the space between the galaxies. The galaxies themselves are not expanding. The ping pong balls stay fixed as new space has been created. And this is not true in the distant past when the galaxies were forming and things were different then. But once you form the galaxies, um, Newton's law of gravity, the inverse square law, is, uh, tells you that that force is strong enough to keep the galaxies together. And it overwhelms Einstein's space creation process in the galaxy. But between the galaxies, the space creation process is what dominates and is pushing the galaxies apart. So we can look at. Um, Another cartoon up here, which is this uh, cake rising, it's got yeast. And this is a, so this is a, a, a one dimensional expansion because it's, they're all in a line. So this image I have up here, it's a three dimensional flat universe because it's Euclidean, there's three dimensions, there's the vertical dimension, the two horizontal dimensions. And the expansion happens in all three dimensions. And so um, the volume is going to expand in proportion to the uh, length cubed, and each length goes with one power of the scale factor. So the volume expands in proportion to the third power of the scale factor. And clearly, um, we can't have edges here because if you have an edge and you look out, it's going to look different than when you look in, and it wouldn't be isotropic. And I argued that on really large scales, everything is isotropic. And so if you want a flat universe, it's going to go out to infinity in all three dimensions. And so we can put down our galaxies, those are the chocolate chips, and we can put an observer on each one. And we can ask the observer in galaxy number two what she sees. And she's going to tell you as the yeast rises, she sees every galaxy move away from her. And we can do the same with an observer on galaxy five and ask him what he sees. And he's going to tell you he sees every galaxy move away from him. So the fact that Cypher was seeing this Doppler shifting didn't mean that he was at the center of an explosion and that everything was moving away. 
And what's happening is that actually every point in space is moving away from every other point in space. And that's what the Big Bang is. Probably in the best model that fits the data now, if you go back in time at the start of the Big Bang, it's infinite in space. And every point in space moves away from every other point in space. And that's the expansion of the universe. And um, it's a uniform expansion. And that's where we get um, the Hubble law from. So Slipher had this little telescope. Hubble, some years later, in the mid-1920s, had access to the 100-inch telescope on um, Mount Wilson, which is north of Los Angeles and the San Gabriel Mountains. And he could resolve individual stars in these galaxies that Slipher had looked at. And he realized that some of these stars were pulsating stars, and including like Cepheid variable stars, which are very, very useful stars because of the relation that Henrietta Leavitt had discovered in 1912. At least that's when the paper was written up. So she discovered this relation between the period of pulsation and the wattage of the star. So it's very difficult to figure out the wattage of a star because you don't know whether it's a very dim star close to you or a bright star far away. But you can measure the pulsation period quite easily if you look at it for a long time. And then you can use this correlation between the pulsation period and the wattage of the star to get the wattage of the star from the pulsation period. And once you have the wattage, you can use the inverse square law for the intensity of light to get the distance. So Hubble was able to resolve individual stars and measure the distance to them. Well, Humison redid um, the Doppler formula for the redshift. And so they, Hubble came up with this law and it was kind of more established by him and Humison later on, a few years later in 1930, 1931. Um, so the velocity, the recession velocity is proportional to the distance. The galaxy twice as far away is moving at twice the speed. So the galaxy three times further far away is moving three times the speed and so on. And you can see that um, this is distance divided by time. That's distance. So this constant here, which is called the Hubble constant, has units of one over time. But astronomers measure uh, velocities in kilometers per second, but they measure distances in megaparsecs. So it's got really strange units um, of kilometers per second per megaparsec, even though it has dimensions of just one over time. So it has a length up in the numerator and a length in the denominator. And this is my favorite value now. So this is the Hubble law. Um, we can look at um, some of the data that tightens up the estimate of the Hubble constant. And this is from the Hubble Space Telescope key project, uh, which was led by Wendy Friedman um, this from 2001. And this is one of the reasons the Hubble Space Telescope was built, was to measure um, fainter galaxies that were much, much further away and to get their redshift and to try to get the distances and plot the recession velocity as a function of distance. The residuals are here, so the units are down here. So if you go to a galaxy 100 megaparsecs away, it's moving away from us at about 7,000 kilometers a second. The galaxy 200 megaparsecs away is moving away at 14,000 kilometers a second. And this red line here was the best fit slope then was 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So my favorite value is around 68 now. And then many, many observations agree with this value. There's a few that give a larger number. So we, we know that the universe is expanding and we know um, that we have, uh, that it's isotropic. So we can kind of assume um, that uh, it's basically isotropic for all observers. So cosmological observers are those observers that are at rest with respect to expansion. So if you have an expanding universe like this, you can have observers that are traveling with rockets, or you can have observers that are at rest with respect to the expansion. And those guys that are at rest with respect to the expansion are called cosmological observers. And these guys are the ones that see it spatially isotropic. 
So if you see spatial isotropy for more than one cosmological observer at a different place, so you're standing here on the Milky Way and then you translate yourself to Andromeda, or you call up your friend in Andromeda and talk to her and ask her whether she sees it's isotropic. And if she also sees it's isotropic, then there's a theorem in geometry that tells you that it's actually homogeneous. And so it's a much, much greater symmetry if all cosmological observers see it's isotropic than if one cosmological observer sees it's isotropic. So if you have homogeneity in space on large scales, then you're restricted to only three possible geometries for the simplest topology. So you have the flat, the open, and closed models. And these are pictures of them. I can't draw the three dimensional ones. So I'm going to draw a two dimensional analog. So we can start with the flat one. And it's going to go to infinity in both dimensions. Because if it didn't, you could go to the edge and look out, and it would look different than when you looked in, and it would be isotropic. And I said on large scales, it's got to be isotropic. So if it's flat, it has zero curvature. And there's this parameter omega, I'll define what it is in seconds, but it's equal to unity for this case. And we have the closed case, like the surface of a balloon, and all you can do is you're a little ant on it, all you can do is walk on it, there's nothing inside, there's nothing outside. It's closed, and dimensionally it has positive curvature, it's also compact, so it's finite. And then finally, you have the opposite of the closed one. You have the open one with negative curvature, and that's saddle shaped, and it's also got to go out to infinity. It's got a negative curvature. So this is under dense, this is over dense, and this is at critical density. Omega is just density a parameter, and I'll explain that in a second. So we have um, this guy, and this guy is probably the easiest guy to think about. So you have a scale factor. As time goes on, it gets bigger and it gets bigger as we get into expanding solution. And you have um, a bunch of little ants, and all they can do is walk along the surface with their measuring sticks. And they can measure that it gets the distance between points gets bigger and bigger. So, this is a physical system, and we need an equation of motion, and um, we need dynamical variables. So, the dynamical variable is the scale factor. And the equation of motion is Einstein's general relativity equations. And scale back of evolution is powered through gravity on those large scales by the space creation process. And the source for that is the energy density. And it's whatever other forms of energy density you have. So um, gravity dominates on these large scales. And we know that we have expansion. So a uh, dot here is going to you know, the time derivative. So the expansion rate is the rate of change of the scale factor divided by the scale factor. And that's the Hubble constant if you evaluate at the present time. It's the Hubble parameter if you evaluate it at a different time. And so we know everything's redshifted, so everything is moving away from us. And so we know that A dot is positive. And the next thing we might want to ask is what is A double dot? Is that Increasing is that positive? Does a dot increase with time? Is there an accelerating expansion, or is there uh, a decelerating expansion with a double dot negative? So the easy thing to do is to take the general relativity equations and derive the acceleration equation here. And it's kind of unfortunate that um, a is the acceleration in f equal to m a. And it's also the scale factor here, but both of those dimensions have been around for a very, very long time, so we can't change them. And every place I have acceleration, I'm going to have two dots. I'm going to use only A for the scale factor. And I'm not going to use A to represent acceleration. So this is uh, acceleration. And this equation is very, very close to Newton's second law in the sense that it's A equal to F over M. And so what we're getting here, um, so we can start by ignoring all this stuff for now. So we have a, a big G here because it's gravity, and this is the mass density. So if we have an infinite universe, we have an infinite mass, and it makes it very, very difficult to write down equations where the mass is greater than the gravitational field. So what we're going to do is go locally. 
look at the mass per unit volume and see that how that's affecting the local gravitational field. And so I'm going to use the mass per unit volume. And so if we look at this, just this part and ignore all these guys for now, we can see what this is telling us. It's telling us there's a negative sign over here. And so if you have enough mass around, you get a deceleration. And that's easily understood. So if you think about two galaxies that are nearby and you make them very, very heavy, you can think of this in terms of Newton's inverse square of gravity, and they're going to pull on each other, and they're going to overwhelm Einstein's space creation process. So you start off the Big Bang, you start off the space creation process, but this mass overwhelms it, and you get deceleration. And that's completely in agreement with your intuition. So if you have a bunch of mass and you increase the mass, then you get an even bigger deceleration. So there's other things that are going on. These galaxies are not just at rest with respect to the expansion. Newton is pulling them together, so they're moving, and so they have kinetic energy, and they have a, a, a effective pressure because that's measuring the one half mv squared. So if I had not used natural units, there would be a c squared in the denominator where that's the speed of light. So because they're moving, they get an even bigger contribution to the deceleration and it slows down the expansion even more. And this term is called the active gravitational mass density, the rho plus 3p. So you have a pretty strong prediction from this equation from general relativity that the expansion is going to be decelerating. So you go and tell your astronomer friends to go measure the expansion rate and measure the deceleration of the acceleration. And they come back and tell you, no, a double dot is not less than zero. It's actually greater than zero. And so you have a problem here. You can either discard general relativity and say this equation is wrong. And so you don't care that it's making the wrong prediction. Or if you're slightly more conservative and you know that general relativity works for binary pulsars, it works for black holes, it works for gravitational waves, it works reasonably well for the cosmic microwave background, then you might want to fix general relativity by introducing a new hypothetical substance. And that's the substance of lambda, the cosmological constant, again, sort of mass density and sort of pressure. But it's got a strange equation of the state. The pressure is negative of the energy density. So in here, in the round parentheses, this pressure is minus rho sub lambda. So the round parentheses is equal to minus two rho sub lambda. And if you make rho sub lambda bigger than rho sub matter or t sub matter, the round parentheses term over here can completely dominate this guy. And everything inside the square parentheses will be negative. And that negative sign would cancel that negative sign and it give you positive and give you acceleration instead of deceleration. And so that's what dark energy is. And one is kind of hopeful. One sees phenomenon like this in the lab with the lamp shift and with the Casimir effect. And one can hope that maybe on cosmological scales, the same thing happens. And that can introduce this cosmological constant of dark energy to give you accelerated expansion. So I'd mentioned this parameter omega. And this parameter does a, a special model, the simplest cosmological model, where the energy density is determined by the Hubble constant and Newton's constant. And it's roughly uh, a few times 10 to the minus 9, 49 grams per cubic centimeter. And this is kind of a messy uh, number to carry around. So people uh, just divide by this critical energy density and they use the omega parameter. And omega has to sum together to be unity. So I don't know if I'm running out of time and I should try to stop or... Okay, so should we have questions now? You want me to go for five minutes and then have questions? Yeah, you can wrap it up with it. Okay. okay, so let me try to go really fast for a few minutes. So let's just try to take the summary of all the stuff in the universe and what they contribute. And at the present time, 5% of the stuff out there is what cosmologists call baryonic matter. And this is what the physicists would call atoms and molecules and electrons and protons and neutrons and stuff like that. 
And that's mostly atoms and molecules and gas clouds and stars and people and blue whales and elephants. And this number started getting thinned down in the late 1960s based on work that Gamow and his um, postdoc and graduate student had done trying to explain the abundances of the light elements. And they realized um, through a really good, uh, really lucky guess that this process would leave over photons in the microwave part of the spectrum. I mean, they had no reason to um, choose the numbers they chose, but they chose the numbers that are reasonably true in, in the real universe. And so they ended up with microwave photons. And these microwave photons were discovered by accident by Pentis and Wilson and Bell Laboratories. And their um, results were interpreted in the companion paper by Dickie Peebles, Roland Wilkinson. And through more precise measurements of the microwave background, people have started putting this number down more accurately. So even earlier than this work in the 1930s, Wiki and a bunch of people uh, were looking at clusters of galaxies. They could see the galaxies moving around each other, and they could measure how fast they were moving from the Doppler formula. And once they knew the speeds, they could use F equal to MA and uh, uh, Newton's uh, one, 1 over R squared force for the gravitational field, and then determine how much mass they would need to create the speeds they were seeing. And, and Zwicky kind of realized that um, when you add up the mass of the stars and the hot gas that was emitting photons, that you needed more than 10 times that amount of mass to produce the speeds you were seeing. So he ended up finding that there was more matter um, out there that wasn't shiny, it was dark. Um, so this is based on assuming F equal to MA and Newton's inverse square law of gravity. And he could measure the speeds. It was non relativistic motion, much, much smaller than the speed of light. So people also call that cold. And um, he didn't know. Uh, that this number was only 5%. So he just called it dark matter. So much later, when people had pinned this number down, they realized it was not made up of atoms and molecules. It was not baryonic. And more recently, it's been uh, pinned down to about 25% of the energy budget. Um, much later than that, um, people came up with this thing they called dark energy in the 1980s. and um, so this is just called energy to distinguish it from this guy. And it's not energy in the sense of kinetic energy or mechanical energy, or electromagnetic energy. It's, it's just kind of an unfortunate use of the same word. It's also dark, so it does not emit or absorb photons. And if it's made up of particles, these particles are very, very light mass. So maybe of the order of 10 to the minus 30 something um, EP. And so they're going to be moving very, very rapidly at speeds close to the speed of light. And it's also not made up of atoms and molecules. And it's by far the biggest contributor to the energy budget now. So this is what we have. And I should probably stop here. And if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So, okay, let's thanks. What's that here in reading slide we have shown some uh, picture of the galaxy or legs galaxy but we can see that the uh, universe full of elementary and rough structure yeah, okay. Also, in case of the local uh, star forming regions, also we see that uh, this kind of uh, filament structure. Yeah. So, what is the main region of this whole universe? Is the local universe is made up of elementary mm -hmm. and of structure? So, um, on beginning, yes. So on, on these scales, it's different than what's happening with star formation yeah. regions. So there it's like gas clouds collapsing under gravity while they're also 
if you if you just consider two nearby gas clouds, they're not spherically symmetric, so they tightly talk up each other, and they also collapse under gravity, so they collapse preferentially in the direction um, that's that they, they, they don't have the the rotation. So they if they start out approximately um, oblate, then they collapse down to um, a, a disc-like structure. And then they start fragmenting. Um, so the Milky Way. So if you look at the Milky Way, you can see the. Uh, sorry, look at um, the planet, uh, solar system. You can see the plane of the ecliptic, and that sort of looks like a filamentary structure, right? With all the planets are in a line, and it's just the way things collapse down to a disk, and that's what you see in these star formation regions. On these scales, it's different. Um, it, it's. Um, the, the collapse is, uh, it, it's again rotation and uh, that you have collapse on the gravity, but that's in the galaxies. But on the larger scales, um, it, it's not completely clear how you form the filaments, how you form the bubbles. And so this, you can do the topology and you can get this, but in, in a, a model under gravitational collapse, you get, um, it's it's a complicated process with the simulations where you form the one-dimensional structures and you form the preferential bubbles and where they intersect uh, that's where the bright galaxies are and you can see the filamentary structure because the bright galaxies stand out and that, that's also true even in the spiral arms because you have that's where the bright stars form so the, the, the matter is not distributed that anisotropically on the surface of the galaxy. So if you see Andromeda over here, you can see the spiral arms stand out quite a bit, but it's not because um, there's a lot more matter there. It's because they have much, much heavier stars that are much, much harder. And so it's uh, uh, an illusion from, from the light. The light is much more concentrated there. Magnet, magnetic stuff for galaxies. Yeah, galaxies. Yeah, so um, there's mag magnet, magnetism on the scale of stars. Right? So you see that with the Zeeman effect. And most galaxies do have magnetic fields, um, typically 5 to 10 microgauss or so at the present output. And the coherence scale is maybe one third or half the size of the galaxy, the linear size. And it's not completely clear where those magnetic fields came from. Um, we, we can talk more about that later. But... Yeah, very nice talk. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's taking it somewhat beyond what you spoke in your talk. But uh, since you work, not only work, you are one of the pioneers of this concept of dark energy. And essentially, I mean, there, there are many models, many mechanisms of dark energy since your work. But uh, yours was based on scalar fields and the potential energy of uh, scalar fields. So subsequently, there have been work using the kinetic energy of scalar fields. Yeah. So the question is uh, briefly, I mean, when can we realistically go through observations to be able to say with some amount of certainty, because one can't be absolutely sure, that dark energy is is manifested through some scalar field, whether it be the kinetic or potential. Yeah, that's um, it's very difficult to predict, the, especially if you want to predict the future. But um, if you have a cosmological constant and you have cold dark matter, that model is called the Lambda CDM model. And, and it does a, a pretty good job at fitting all the observations. But the problem with the cosmological constant is you can't tie it to anything else in physics and it um, makes it much easier to make it a dynamical variable. And that was the motivation for us to make it a scalar field. And the scalar field is, um, depending on the potential energy density you choose, it's not going to give you a constant energy density. It's going to vary with time. And so it's going to give you a slightly different acceleration in a double dot. And maybe um, when the observations get sensitive enough, they'll be able to measure that difference. And I'm not sure when that's going to happen. So the main experiments now 
is uh, one that's taking data, it's called DASC, it's a dark energy spectroscopic instrument, and it's um, a telescope in Arizona, and they sh should have redshifts of maybe 40, 000, 40 million objects um, within four or five years. So the present time we have redshifts for maybe two million galaxies total. This is a factor of 20 increase in the number of redshifts. And so maybe that'll be good enough to measure the expansion rate from now to a redshift of about three and a half or so. And that might be um, good enough to tell us whether it's possibly a scalar field. If that doesn't work, um, European Space Agency just launched this Euclid Space Telescope. And maybe that in another six, seven years will do a better job. And if that doesn't work, um, NASA has another space telescope. It's a, a Roman space telescope. And I think they're going to launch that in two or three years. And maybe that'll do it. But it's kind of unclear yeah. when. <laughs> yeah, but realistically, say around 2030 or something, we should have a window at least mapping, charting the expansions. Yeah, mm -hmm. to the red shift of uh, three, three and a half. Three, three and a half. Yeah, and that's much able, more precision than we have. Yeah, now. that should be able to measure the acceleration. Uh, yeah, hopefully uh, it'll be sufficient. The equation of state parameters. Yeah, as well. yeah. Hopefully it'll be precise enough to distinguish between dynamical dark energy and cosmological constant. But it's difficult to say. Thanks. So uh, due to time constant, let's stop here. Okay. Okay. You want to? Okay. Sorry, John. Yeah, uh, I will get one question. So like, uh, I have also seen a couple of recent papers. Uh, where, uh, where this is probably the negative cosmology function. So their model is dark energy is a combination of such energy by uh, some lambda. Yeah. So they took both and make the lambda to be negative. In that way, they uh, they, they were able to match uh, all the last few observations like the procedure. And also try to lift up that uh, how will it Yeah. I don't know how relevant are their models. Uh, yeah, it's kind of difficult to tell. So um, I, I don't know who, what to say about the Hubble tension, right? So um, there are many, many, many measurements of them, and people just focus on two of them, which is Planck, that gives you about 67 and a half, and um, Reese's group, that gives you 73. But um, you can find a paper that gives you any value between those two. And so I don't know. Um, whether you should just focus on these two sets of measurements and say that they're intention when there's hundreds of measurements that lie between them. And so I think um, if you're going to motivate a model based on the Hubble tension, it, it better be giving you predictions for other things and it agrees with other things. And I mean, if you introduce both the cosmological constant and the scalar field, you're introducing enough parameters to fit more things than the just the lambda CDM model. And the lambda CDM model doesn't do that badly. So I, I don't know. I think um, it's going to be much more convincing. OK, so uh, and let us thanks for once again. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you want any of those cards, there's more of them. You can come in front and get them. So this time we got you for a short time. Hope in the coming future we will see you again. Thank you. I, I hope so.